Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Welcome again to another show of Business Innovators Radio Network. This is Terry Palmer, your host, and we've got a special show with you for today. Today we have Robert Inerio, who is a criminal defense attorney here in Greenville, and we have a very interesting topic about the Monsanto uh, case and Roundup. But before we get into that, uh, Robert, are you there? Yes, Terry, I am. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for joining us today. Robert, tell us a little bit about yourself and your law firm and, and you know, how you came about, how long you've been in Greenville? All right. Um, I graduated law school in 2008. I had a job lined up to do mergers and acquisitions, but uh, I got a call a couple of weeks for the bar exam, and the company told me they were predicting a massive economic collapse in the third quarter, and they dissolved my position. So at the age of 30 years old, I moved home with my parents, begrudgingly. I got a job in a bar, and uh, one of my customers got a DUI. A guy in the kitchen got caught selling pot. And next thing you know, I became a criminal defense lawyer here in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, I've been doing that for a decade, but you know, about halfway into that, I started taking on accident and injury cases as well. And then in you know, late 2018, I got involved with the Monsanto Roundup litigation through a colleague of mine who's working on the case, and now we're working together on uh, several several Roundup cases. So uh, my understanding, like when I can't turn on the TV hardly and not see a commercial now of people talking about the, the cases of Monsanto and Roundup, can you bring uh, my listening audience up to far, like what the courts have said about Monsanto and the Roundup case and, and what's moving forward? Gladly. Um, this is an incredible oversimplification of the status of things, but in uh, – in Roundup, there's a chemical called glyphosate, and glyphosate um, is, appears, you know, according to the World Health Organization, is a probable human carcinogen. Um, what's leading to all of the litigation is that in the 80s and 90s, Monsanto knew or certainly should have known that glyphosate was causing cancer. Um, one of the early studies came out and said, yes, glyphosate does indeed cause cancer, and, you know, this is just a telltale sign of what Monsanto knows. They did not allocate any money to do independent research, but they allocated, I think it was $17 million to discredit that particular study by casting doubt upon the data that was there and having um, people reinterpret it. Um, Monsanto is also, um, looks like they've ghostwritten studies and basically paid scientists to put their names on these studies that were then turned over to the EPA. And you know, as a casual consumer for years, I always thought that the EPA did independent research, and if the EPA says it's good, then you don't have to worry. Well, it turns out the EPA does not do any independent research, um, and we believe that Monsanto knew this. Going a little bit further into the timeline and around the mid-'90s, um, Monsanto developed the genetically modified organism, or the GMOs, which we hear all over today. And... What happened with the GMO is before the GMO was implemented, a farmer would have to go and spray weed by weed over all of his acres and be very careful not to get his weed or other crops wet with Roundup and then kill them. Well, the genetically modified organism allows farmers to spray the entire crop and the Roundup-resistant seeds, which is actually called Roundup Ready, those seeds will flourish and be immune to the glyphosate, but everything else will continue on uh, or will die. And that led to a lot of glyphosate trickling down into our food. Um, also in the early 2000s, Monsanto began to advocate for an off-label use for Roundup. And essentially, when you harvest wheat, it needs to sit and take a couple of days, a couple of weeks um, to dry out before it can get to market. And Monsanto was then advertising to farmers that you could spray your entire crop after it's harvested and it will dry out 
several days sooner and you can get it to market faster. While Monsanto was developing the seeds and while they were advocating to spray entire crops, they were bending over backwards to ignore all possible signs that this caused cancer. And now what's happened is the glyphosate, when it reacts with our lymphatic system in the, in the human body, it's causing pretty much uh, every form of lymphoma you can think of. If it's a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it is possibly caused by Roundup and the glyphosate that's in there. Well, Monsanto knew that this was dangerous. They didn't do anything about it. They actually encouraged it to go across the board. Let's use it even more. And now as a result, you can't pick up a box of cereal that doesn't have trace amounts of glyphosate in it. And when you hear about the rise of gluten allergies and celiac disease, you know, I'm, I'm human like everyone else. I thought when this stuff started popping up in the mid-2000s and late 2000s that it was just the new trendy thing to be gluten intolerant. It turns out that glyphosate also acts on the gut bacteria, and it, the rise in celiac and gluten intolerance corresponds with the increased marketing and use of Roundup. So this stuff is literally cancerous and causing a bunch of problems, and, you know, that's, that in and of itself is not bad. We have things that cause cancer. You know, we can still go and buy a pack of cigarettes knowing that they cause cancer. But the difference is that on that pack of cigarettes, it has a warning label. It says this may cause cancer. This will cause cancer. And if you see the European warning labels, it's horrible. They've got pictures of dead children and uh, you know, sickly people missing half of their face through jaw cancer. So there's a very strong warning, and the consumer has the opportunity to make the decision, do I want to risk cancer or not? Monsanto denied the American consumer that option. Monsanto knew that it caused cancer, and all they had to do was put a warning label on the bottle that said, this stuff is a probable human carcinogen. And then it gives us, the consumer, the choice between do we want to get down on our hands and knees and pick every single weed out of our garden the old-fashioned way, or do we want to spray this chemical and risk cancer? Monsanto took it even one step further in some of their initial uh, advertising and claimed that it was safer than table salt. The irony of that is salt in a large enough quantity will kill you. Um, Monsanto just didn't pick up on that, I guess, or somebody in the marketing department didn't get it. And going further into their conduct, when the World Health Organization came out in 2015 and said that, yes, this is indeed a probable human carcinogen, Monsanto didn't put a warning label on there. Instead, they're fighting tooth and nail on all of these cases. Um, I believe last count, there's something like 16 or 17,000 cases that have been filed Three of those have gone to verdict, and I believe the verdicts were, I think, 289 million, 80 million, and the most recent verdict um, for a husband and wife plaintiff was a little over $2 billion. And that kind of brings us up to where we are today with this litigation. Um, Monsanto, actually, Monsanto has now been bought out by Bayer, the Aspen people. Um, they cannot continue to take massive losses like this without facing bankruptcy. And their stock price just since acquiring Monsanto in July of 2018 has dropped 40%. So if Bayer doesn't put some sort of reconciliation on the table and begin settling out these cases, it could be catastrophic for an incredibly large multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical company and the CEO of Bayer is in a really, really tough spot because somebody either didn't do their due diligence with the pending litigation when the buyout occurred, or they just completely and totally misjudged how serious this was. You know, there's, there's a lot more to that, but that kind of brings us up to where we are today. Well, yeah, that, that definitely does. I, um, let me ask you a question. So you were mentioning farmers and stuff. Would this affect normal people, like just people in their gardens? I mean, who should be concerned about this? 
everyone should be concerned about this. Um, the first trial that went was for what's known as an occupational user, and he was the groundskeeper for an elementary school. The second and third trials were residential users, where it was, I think, like a hobbyist gardener or somebody that has several acres and they just want to spray to keep the weeds back. So, you know, everyone can come down with this. Um, one of my clients, she developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma at the age of seven. And that was because her mom had a nice garden and was working in it. The little girl wanted to help mommy. Mommy believed what Roundup said, or Monsanto said Roundup was safer than table salt, so she let her little girl go and spray the weeds. And at the age of seven, this girl developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, you know, I've got clients in their teens and 20s. I've got two brothers in their mid-20s that don't have any of the precursors for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and within a couple of years, both of them developed it. And it was residential use, you know, typical summer gardening, working off you've got any level of property. Um, but where we see definitely the highest incidence is, is greenskeepers, farmers, professional landscapers. But generally, everyone that touches this stuff needs to be incredibly careful because it can seep through your skin, you know, it's similar like the way it seeps through the structure of a plant and it goes through and attacks the inside and stops the photosynthesis process and basically stops the plant from receiving nourishment and causes it to wither up and die. Uh, it's doing uh, very similar things to us. And when it gets on our skin, it's going into our lymphatic system and it's spreading like wildfire. So that's a horrible thing. So let me ask you another question. Be because of the intensity of the ads I've seen lately, is that meaning that there's a, a time frame or something? Because, you know, all of a sudden there's a lot more activity going on on, on trying to help people that have this. Is that a concern for anybody who might think they have uh, an issue with this? Um, there are certain instances where a statute of limitations comes up, but where we're seeing more activity right now on television, um, I believe Q, end of Q1 or sometime in Q2 is the next shareholders meeting at Bayer. Um, hedge fund managers have kind of let it be known that they will more or less withdraw all of their investments in Bayer unless they settle this thing out because it's an unsafe investment. If it's dropping 40%, you're not going to renew that. There's been rumors that Bayer is beginning to consider settling these. Um, and going along with that rumor, um, they just recently sold off their animal sciences division for, uh, I think, 6 or $7 billion, and they're liquidating assets. And there's been no statements of saying, you know, beginning January 1st of 2020, we're going to settle all these cases. But the indications are there that these cases are going to settle. Um, now, what really makes this important for all of our listeners out there, the way that this litigation works is that it goes into something called multi-district litigation. Think of that like a school bus coming home from school. Everyone gets on the same school bus and all these cases are compiled and some of the similar motions to suppress or motions to allow, motions to redact, things like that will apply to all of the cases. But when we get to a certain stop, each case gets off the bus and they'll proceed through litigation on their own. Well, as a result, every attorney has cases that's in the inventory of the MDL. And what a lot of MDL settlements look like, and we, we the plaintiff's attorneys believe is going to happen with the Monsanto litigation, is that they'll go to, Monsanto will go to the first tier, the, the big names, the guys that have large inventory, the, the super firms, and they'll say, okay, Mr. Super Firm, we'll give you dollar per dollar for your case value according to the settlements formula. But the caveat is that you can no longer take any more cases. And then they'll go to the second tier guys and they'll say, we'll give you 80 cents on the dollar according to the settlement formula. But the caveat is that you can no longer take any more cases. And they're going to do that all the way down the pipeline until they get to the guys that have onesies or twosies or, you know, just a couple of cases, at which point they'll offer 10 cents on the dollar. And their response will be, if you don't like it, 
we're a multi-billion dollar corporation. How much money do you have to fight this? So while there's no deadline and there's no expiration date, settlements are going to start coming, you know, Sometime, again, we as plaintiff's attorneys believe in the 2020 calendar year, we'll see the first group of settlements, and they'll be going most likely on an inventory basis, which means once those start settling out, it's going to become harder and harder to find an attorney that would take your case or is even able to take your case. So that's why you're seeing an increase in the Roundup advertising on television is that attorneys are trying to build up their inventories and get as many cases in as they can because once the cases settle out, they're not going to be able to take on anymore until it dwindles down to the small handful of folks that don't have the ability or the financial backing to take on a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar corporation. Okay, so what I understand then, the importance of that, me as a layperson, knowing nothing about the law and stuff, but if I had this, so if I wait and all this other stuff goes happen, there'll be less attorneys out there that can take my case because of the settlement they have. And the ones that might be able to are so small, they won't be able to afford taking on the, the large corporation. Is that kind of what you're saying? So the, the earlier I get someone to see if I even have a case, the better for me to do this. Is that what you're saying? That is absolutely correct. Um, Wow. Because if wow. if you let this just sit, you're not going to find a good home for it. And as as the plaintiff, or in this case as a client of mine, the involvement is, you know, I think there's a five, six-page questionnaire, just how often did you use Roundup, when did you start using it, Did how did you use it, professionally or occupationally. And depending upon how you answer, most of that questionnaire is remaining blank. But if they fill out the questionnaire and the health release and the retainer and send it back, there's not really anything they have to do other than keep in touch, let me know if they change their phone number, if they change their address or anything. Right, right. And then we'll go ahead and build up the case and work it up. When they get close to settlement time, then we'll contact each client and let them know, okay, this is the value of the case according to the settlement formula. This is where we stand. And... If they take it, there's no further work. So maybe 30 minutes to an hour up front maximum is what their investment is, and then they could yield a bunch of money. Um, I know I talked about a $289 million verdict and $80 million and $2 billion. Um, you know, not everybody's going to get that, and those verdict amounts are being slashed because the punitive damages were far in excess of the actual so the $289 million verdict got reduced to two, uh, 79, and that's under appeal. But if all of these verdicts end up hitting, the company is going to go bankrupt and no one will get paid. So at some point, there's going to be settlements made on offers made on the cases that are out there that would allow um, Bayer and basically through Monsanto to put these cases behind them and move forward. So not everybody is going to be getting becoming a multimillionaire off of this. I don't want to give that impression, but my clients already have cancer. They've had to go through and deal with some horrifying experiences, and in some place, cases they've lost loved ones incredibly prematurely. I've got one client who had to go through three batches of chemo, and he would basically have non-Hodgkin's, go through chemo, come out, get healthy, start working in his garden again, relapse, and it was on his third relapse he figured out, wait a minute, something's something's wrong. It must be the roundup. Uh, so, you know, and yeah. How can you account for that? For At 36 years old, he begins what now becomes a lifelong struggle. So really all my clients need to do is contact me. Um, that can be found at upstateroundupattorney.com or area code 864 864- Two five five ninety nine eighty eight. I'll talk to them for a few minutes, make sure they do have one of the qualifying forms of cancer, send them the paperwork, and then that's it. Uh, you know, just keep in touch, and I'll let them know as things progress and develop. But it's nothing dramatic. It's nothing stressful. It's essentially money that if they don't file a claim, they're not going to get. But if they do file a claim, they're going to be in a pretty good spot. I understand. So, so the bottom line, you are taking on new clients, uh, whether they're here in yes. Greenville or anywhere, correct? They don't just have to be in Greenville. Is that correct? 
No, it does not just have to be in Greenville um, because this is being handled through federal litigation and I'm a member of the federal bars as well as the South Carolina bar. I can take any case located anywhere in the United States. Hawaii, I've got a client in Hawaii. Um, I don't have a client in Alaska yet. I've got one in Nebraska. I've got a bunch in Florida. And it does not just have to be limited to South Carolina. I can take them anywhere and, you know, help them out. Well, oh, I appreciate that, and I appreciate your time. Robert, would you give me your website slower again one more time and the telephone number for any of our listening audience that might themselves or have loved ones that need to get a hold of you? Uh, give that to us again, please. Absolutely. Um, the website is upstateroundupattorney.com, and that's simply because I'm located in upstate South Carolina. And the phone number is area code 864 255 9988 and that'll go straight to my paralegal um part of her deal is that she has to answer the phones after hours as long as she's awake in exchange for that i pay her nicely and i'm pretty flexible when it comes on vacation but they can call my paralegal get the info and it doesn't matter what time of day it is they'll call they'll get her and she'll get me on the phone as soon as i'm available if i'm in court i'll get the message i'll call once i'm out of court or if it's late at night i'll get the message in the morning and follow up. And usually I can follow up within 12 to 24 hours, depending upon when that call is placed. Well, Robert, thank you for your time and, and bringing us up to date on this. I know uh, a lot of my listening audience has seen that on TV, kind of wondered what they are. Did, may, could have thought maybe this isn't for me, but guys, if you're, um, you know, a gardener and like to dabble in outside and you use Roundup, you probably need to get a hold of Robert so you can at least find out if there's something he can help you with. Robert, thank you for your time. Um, oh, thanks, I wish Jerry. you all the best. And uh, we'll, we'll talk again. Guys, thank you for listening. This has been another episode of Business Innovators Radio Network. And this is Terry Palma signing off. Say, be good and do your best. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.